Welcome to the Pearson Centre Conference on the new challenges for the Canada we want. My name is Francesca Yacorto and I'm a, a director at the Pearson Centre. I'm also the Vice President of Communications and Advocacy at the Conference for Advanced Life Underwriting, KALU. I want to start by acknowledging that we are meeting on the land of the First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We pay our respect to Indigenous peoples across Canada, as well as to their ancestors for their immeasurable contributions to this country. As you may know, the Pearson Centre is a leading progressive think tank that addresses the major economic and social challenges of the day. We are proud to say that we are the only think tank that invites representatives from all five federal political parties, along with the top business, labor and civil society leaders, as well as many other experts. As we like to say, we bring people and ideas together. And now a very special thank you to all our donors and sponsors that make Pearson events possible. In particular, our sustaining sponsors that include Canada's Building Trades Unions, the International Association of Firefighters, and MFSEO, Ontario's professional employees. And of course, also a very special thank you to the special sponsors who are making this particular conference possible, including Bayless Medical, the Hill Times, and the Canadian Health Coalition. Now, very briefly on the format, we will have a discussion with our uh, very special guest for about 40 minutes, uh, at which time we will turn the floor over to you, the audience, uh, to ask the questions that you wish. So please use the question box on your screen and we will get to as many of them as possible before we wrap up at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. <laughs> Our webinar today is What is the World Coming To? Our special guest is Stephen Polas, who of course served as the ninth governor of the Bank of Canada from 2013 to 2020. He's also taught economics at the University of Western Ontario, Concordia University and the Queen's School of Business. Since 2013, Mr. Polas has been a member of the Lawrence Centre Advisory Council and more recently a director at Enbridge and special advisor to the Toronto-based law firm Osler, Hoskin and Harcourt. His recently published book, The Next Age of Uncertainty, is a primer on the economic volatility ahead. He will be in conversation with Sandra Pubatello, who served in the Legislative Assembly of Ontario from 1995 until 2011 as a minister in the government of Dalton McGuinty. She is currently the president at Canadian International Avenues Limited. And on that note, I will turn the floor over to you, Sandra. Thank you so much and welcome. Thanks, Francesca. Welcome, Stephen, to the Pearson Centre and to another discussion. I, I decided to bring a book and I know I warned you to say that this is my version of the book. I'm hoping that you can see it properly. Uh, this is an audio version. Uh, I should buy the hardcover just so you get more royalty as well. Uh, now that you, you know, you're post uh, Bank of Governor status. But uh, I'll work on that. I said every time I every time I think of Stephen now, I think of being on my rowing machine, which is when I was listening to the book. But it, you know what? It was a great read. So it's a great launch for the conference that the Pearson Center is engaged in talking about the future and what Canadians are hoping for uh, in Canada. And you've got a real knack. You did this when you were at EDC, when you were at the Bank of Canada, being able to talk to people in everyday language. You don't need to be an economist to understand uh, the concepts that you were bringing forward. So congratulations on a, on a great success for this book, The Next Age of Uncertainty. And I really wanted to turn the floor to you and ask you, um, what, what did you hope to achieve with this book, given what's happening in the world today? And I, I would suggest that um, g given what's happened recently, like over the course of the la last couple of months, I'm going to ask, would you have added a chapter and what might that be about? So over to you, Stephen. <laughs> well, thanks very much, uh, Sandra, and thanks very much to the Pearson Center to, for having me in today to talk to you. Uh, people ask, you know, what, what, what motivated me to write a book? Well, I, fig I figured I needed something to do during COVID, to be honest. No, there was no traveling going on. I had recently retired and uh, I had had on my mind uh, perhaps contributing to the conversation around short-termism and uh, corporate governance. Uh, you know, this problem that corporations basically look one quarter ahead and make their numbers and, you know, maybe they have once a year a planning session, but, you know, a few weeks after that planning session, that's thrown out the window. We just got to make our numbers. 
Uh, so um, I thought perhaps as an economist, I could bring a, a longer term framework uh, into those conversations. And when I started thinking about that, I realized, you know, economists usually think of the economy much the same way to think of a bobblehead doll. You know, the things are always disturbing the bobblehead and then it, it finds its place again and settles there. Uh, that's kind of what is the basic property in economic models. Um, and um, one and more I thought about what, what determined where it would rest, uh, you know, after it had been disturbed. I realized a lot of the things that I thought of more or less as constants are not constants. They're actually in motion. And it so happens that where we are today, uh, they're really in motion, not just a steady bit of motion, but take population aging. It's moving fast now because of the unwinding of the baby boom effect, you know, from 50 years, 60 years ago. So the next thing I knew, I was in the middle of this piece, which was about these moving, as I call them, tectonic forces, and thinking through not just one at a time, but what happens when they're all moving together. And I realized there's mathematics that you can appeal to there, which is that nonlinear forces, when they interact, can often give rise to explosive outcomes that are completely unpredictable uh, from, uh, from the underlying framework. So that kind of gave me that that basic message of let's look long term, but as soon as we do, uh, we're into rising tide of volatility and therefore risk uh, for companies. Yeah, and you did use a really good example of that with the housing market crashing in the U.S. and and, and sort of this the subprime issue and how uh, those little tiny ripples suddenly all the house cards fell down and it was a really good description that we could all understand. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, that book was written before Ukraine, before the war in Ukraine, and it's almost um, it's put everything on steroids. Every every chapter you've got about nine elements that you've described throughout the book. Um, every one of them kind of exponential now because of the war. And, yeah. you know, inflation is what we're all talking about. It was referenced in the last budget. We'll talk about the budget from last week in a little bit. But would if you had to add the chapter, would it be the war and, and what its impact is on, on each of the elements you described? Uh, possibly. I mean, it's such a profound experience that it's going to be hard not to uh, think of that as a, a new point of departure for almost all analysis. But the way I really think of it, you know, I mean, obviously I finished <clears throat> writing the book uh, last summer uh, in August. Uh, so, um, you know, lots of things happened uh, since then, but I think the, the, the core point of my book, uh, Sandra, is that none of this is actually predictable. Uh, none of the things that we, you know, the events in life that we think of as, oh, ever since this happened or ever since that happened, Usually those events, uh, you might even think of them as black swan events. They're very unusual events and uh, they become our new reference point. They're, they're not predictable by businesses. Um, what I'm really arguing is given that the forces that are acting, it means that any catalyst uh, can generate a very big outsized uh, event or major volatility. So obviously it could be a bat from Wuhan uh, that is the catalyst, or it could be a lunatic from Moscow that is the catalyst. When those things hit those interactive systems, what we get is big eruptions in the economy and in financial markets. So I think the pandemic and uh, the, the war in Ukraine basically illustrate just how fundamentally unprepared we are for risk outcomes. Uh, in many ways, we got lucky uh, in, in, during the pandemic that we had enough fiscal capacity to take care of business around the world. In some places, there wasn't capacity, but they did it anyway. Uh, but that means that we don't have capacity for the next big event, what it, whatever it may be. And so that's, uh, that's a, risk, a, a risk environment in which we need to be more prepared on all fronts. We learned our hospitals run really well except when there's a major event like this. And then, well, it turns out we have no buffer in our hospital system when there is a big event. Uh, in fact, we don't have even close to a buffer because we had to shut down all those surgeries and so on in order to deal with COVID patients. Mm -hmm. So I think in general, the lesson is we need to be better prepared. 
Well, and you did talk about black swans in your book. And uh, I guess my question, like at some point, black swans, A, aren't supposed to be predictable. And mm -hmm. yet you thought that some that they they called a black swan, in fact, were predicted by some people. So at what point do you say, how many black swans before you have to think of another bird <laughs> and call it something else? Because uh, these things are, it's sort of like disruption is now predictable. And yeah. that's the way we're going. Um, are we ever going to find that? Uh, you know, how do you how do you get enough to gird your loins for the next round? Yeah, well, the the true distinction between a black swan and something that should be anticipated is mm -hmm. uh, is a hard one to make, uh, and of course, a very fine distinction there, which is not really that important for a business person or for a household. Uh, what matters is to think of when 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 we get used to thinking of you know the t the common the bell curve distribution of how things happen. We, we generally think mostly about the middle. And uh, every once in a while, uh, say in a corporate boardroom, uh, the board will spend time with management discussing, you know, one or two potential outlier scenarios just to understand how the business is prepared for, uh, for, for unusual outcomes. Uh, not black swans, literally, but things that you weren't really banking on. And uh, and so when they do that, they usually use extreme scenarios uh, to illustrate how the company would be hit or how it might benefit. And then uh, the board routinely would say, well, OK, that all sounds good, but I think the core scenario looks the most likely. Now, that's that's kind of bell curve thinking. And uh, Taleb, in his book, The Black Swan, went to great lengths to try and convince us we shouldn't think about the bell curve. Uh, in terms of risk, what we should do, be doing is thinking about almost a, a square box of possibilities. Like nothing is that improbable that you shouldn't think about it. And so you always need to be, as, a, as, an, as an organization, as a company, as a government, or as an individual, have your buffers there and ready in case, in case some bad luck comes along. Bearing in mind, of course, that you get good luck too. I mean, they tend to be that's what volatility is like. It's it's got two sides to it. Uh, but we we what we find when we have these events is, you know, fiscally we were pretty well prepared for the pandemic, more prepared than most countries. But the question you have to ask now is how prepared are we for another bout of volatility that's similar or different and yet similar in magnitude? And so those are the kinds of longer longer term thinking that we need to have in these conversations. Yeah, I, I think that was a bit of the view that people were giving to the budget that just got tabled last week, like what was going to happen? How was she going to manage uh, the debt level, uh, the spend level? There was a lot of expectation, a lot of hand wringing. Um, you think she hit the right note? Um, and I wouldn't mind a comment because you did talk about debt in your book, uh, how Canada is faring. And I guess that question, should our grandchildren be worried? Uh, about what we're doing today uh, in terms of government's expenditure. Yeah, so it's of course it's always a popular uh, popular occupation to bash the budget. Um, I mean to try and be objective about it, I would say it exceeded expectations. Certainly my expectations. Um, I think of it this way: uh, in the budget, of course, we had a we the economy had proved to be much stronger. Uh, that had been built into almost anybody's forecast for the last two years, and, this, and in particular the government's. Well, the government's forecasts are based on private sector uh, submissions, so everybody kind of agrees up front. That's a reasonable set of assumptions. Well, the economy had outperformed all that, plus inflation had been higher. So for those two reasons, revenues were far stronger uh, than had been built into the, to the previous budget. And uh, in addition, there were some increases in taxes, uh, the, 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 not, not a lot, but some significant things that were done uh, to increase revenues. So when you take that total bucket of revenue, the surprise from the economy plus the additions from new, new taxes, I think a lot of people expected all that room to maneuver to be used, you know, in new, uh, new initiatives, especially given the the you know the, uh, the, the, the 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 collaboration between uh, liberal and NDP uh, uh, groups and so with 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 that in mind you look at it and you discover that in fact 
uh, roughly half of that room to maneuver was spent on new initiatives and the other half uh, roughly was dedicated to causing that debt ratio to fall faster than it otherwise would. And by the way, uh, back uh, at, the, at the worst time in the pandemic, the expectation was that the government debt to GDP ratio would go well above 50%, starting from 30%, you know, before the pandemic came along. And that's borrowing 20% of GDP to weather the storm. It's enormous and it's very common around the world, similar kinds of numbers. Well, now that deficit, that debt rather, the debt ratio is peaking at 46%, so five points less. That's a that's a hundred billion dollars less than uh, than pot than the, the the that sort of challenging expectation, and it's forecast to fall by around one percentage point per year. So it gets down to the almost to forty percent, forty one percent, and that a set of assumptions again does not capture any new growth that comes from the initiatives. So say for instance one out one of my favorites is childcare. Uh, which is pretty well guaranteed to add to uh, labor force participation by parents, mostly women probably, uh, and therefore boost the growth trend line. Well, that in turn will boost both the denominator of the debt to income ratio, and of course will we'll also contribute more to revenues, if essentially pay for itself over time. And what that means then is that that 41% destination for the debt ratio is actually going to be better uh, than that. It's going to be lower than that. So that baseline has the government build, rebuilding their fiscal buffers, which is something I'll, I'll say chapeau about. We're still a long ways from 30% where we started all of this. So maybe close to 40%, but at least the plan is there and it's moving. And I expect there'll be more opportunities in the next couple of budgets to accelerate that decline further because the economy will perform better than what's built, built into that baseline. One thing, uh, last thing, if I may, uh, Sandra, and that is there's still a deficit, right, this year and next year, uh, not a trivial one. And with the economy already at, um, obviously, at full employment, some would argue it's in excess demand, there's no question, therefore, that, the, the, that those deficits are adding to excess demand in the economy which raises certain risks, including the potential that you know, inflation risk would be a little higher because of it. But in that sense, I want to acknowledge that there's some significant supply side uh, initiatives there, which will, which will work to increase supply and therefore help reduce the excess demand in the economy. So we can't just you know, say mechanically it will add to inflation pressures. But I just mentioned childcare. That's a really important one. Yeah. The temporary foreign worker program has been expanded. That's a really important program for employers, not just for farm workers and so on. We used to use it all the time to hire PhD economists at the Bank of Canada. Uh, that, that is a very strong program. Higher immigration estimates and resources to manage uh, higher rates of immigration. And of course, the carbon capture um, utilization storage uh, tax credits are going to boost investment among other things. So these are supply side policies that will help increase productivity and they're going to grow that base and pay for themselves over time. So I think there's unbalance. I don't really see it as much of an inflation story from the budget either. I think that there are offsets there that people should acknowledge. Well, and you know, it's it's sort of maybe they read your book before they drafted the budget because I thought they were reacting quite well uh, in the budget to a number of the the issues that you've identified that it, that are sort of like the frog in the boiling pot like before you know it here we are and yet it's been a long time coming sort of the graying of the nation and the baby boomers uh, <clears throat> becoming seniors um, you talked about productivity and uh, it may have been in the paragraph or, or chapter around technology that uh, we've got to get wise in how we're using technology we simply don't have the people in the labor force that we need and we've got to increase productivity so you've got to make do with what you have and and take advantage of all of these changes um, maybe speak for a moment about your comments related to technology how it relates to productivity uh, and then, if we can, uh, in a moment, I'd like to talk about uh, climate change initiatives that uh, that you also referenced. Well, for sure. I mean, uh, we, we acknowledge that for a while we've been kind of, and I'll say, entering. You know, it's we're in the early stages of 
what's come to be called the fourth industrial revolution, which is the digitization of almost all aspects of the economy. It's, it's uh, you know, the parallel is with when we electrified the economy in the early 1900s, or when we, you know, deployed computer chips, you know, a general purpose technology that spreads everywhere. Digitization is like that. And of course, it spills over into some fabulous areas like artificial intelligence, and uh, and biotechnology. Those 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 are the big products. And you watch, see, you saw how people uh, developed uh, vaccines in just a few months. You know, to COVID. Well, you know, we could never do that before. This is this is productivity uh, that's in, in many ways absolutely amazing. But we should bear in mind that it, even the computer chip, which sounds like a very now a very obvious thing that would boost productivity. I mean, it was in the the late 70s, uh, early 80s, we got our first PCs at work and that sort of thing and started, you know, typing our own stuff, writing on terminals instead of having it typed in a typing pool. Well, that just spread everywhere. But it wasn't really until about 95 to 2005 in there when we got the true wave of productivity increase from that new technology. My expectation is that the fourth industrial revolution will work will work faster. And one of the reasons is the pandemic, because when the pandemic came along two years ago, people just leapt into new tech, uh, which is, of course, one of the reasons why we have a shortage of computer chips even now, uh, because of all the things that got invested in uh, in those early, early weeks. Um, and so I think uh, we're going to see an acceleration of productivity. It may take a couple of years or three years before the statisticians catch up to it, and it can, because it's very hard to pick these things up as it was back in the 1980s and early 90s. Uh, but eventually it's there. And the way it happens is uh, new, new technology, what it does is it, it reduces costs for the person who deploys it. Uh, you, in the first instance, that's great for profitability and all that. But what happens, of course, is your competitor does the same thing. And then you're going to compete against one another. And so the benefits, a lot of them get passed along to everybody through lower prices. Every industrial revolution has given us a deflationary phase or at least a disinflationary phase. Now, I remember all those years that Greenspan was trying to get inflation up, you know, it was because of the third industrial revolution. So we'll see that again over the next uh, few years. And as that happens, inflation will be actually probably lower than most people expect in that frame. And so the way you'll rationalize that is because the supply side of the economy is outperforming, that productivity is happening. Now, I think that's going to happen, no question about it. But I think the reason we've fallen behind everybody in productivity is not so much that we don't deploy technology, although we have deployed it, I would say, on average, more slowly than other countries. But there's a lot of barriers, a lot of things that kind of get in the way uh, here in Canada, and maybe as simple as uncertainty about laws or frameworks or policies or just the future. Uh, we went through four years during the Trump administration where people held back on their investments. Uh, well, why? If, you're, if, you're, if your investment success depends on NAFTA, well, you don't really want to bet everything on that since it's about to be torn up. It's what we heard, you know, day after day after day all that time. And it took almost the whole time to resolve that. And even then, there was still the risk that it would still be ignored, if not torn up. So it's that kind of uncertainty that gets in the way or red tape gets in the way. We're developing a reputation for not really being able to decide things very well. Um, and so as a consequence, that sort of no, a notion of red tape or process over speed uh, is slowing things down. And many of these things are things that governments uh, have the power to fix. I think taking some of those impediments out of the way will give us a much bigger investment boom and therefore more productivity. We could focus our efforts there because that doesn't cost any money. It just takes a bit of work to get a collaboration between the feds and the provinces, for instance, on interprovincial issues, you know, regulatory differences. Well, that can add up to four percentage points to our economy. That that should be done, Sandra. So we, we need it really badly now. Well, you're talking a lot about leadership, and, and I've heard you make comments about this, and certainly in your book, this may be a time to practice my Vulcan symbol. Um, do you oh, have very good. Well yet? done. 
<laughs> just for everybody watching to know that you're a Star Trek fan, but more um, sort of you use those characters from movies and television as sort of the, the example of the kind of leadership uh, that you appreciated growing up, the characteristics that you watched for. So in these discussions about what needs to happen in a more polarized uh, environment for sure, uh, in the kind of politicization of the most simplest of things like like research you know that frustrate a lot of people to watch um do you want to talk about you so how would you how would you change that um because it is going to take leadership it may take a different kind of characteristic that, than, we, than what we've had in the past yeah well you raise a good point sandra and to be honest uh i come away from having thought about that for quite a while i come away a bit uh, a bit discouraged uh frankly a little bit concerned that it may not happen. And the reason is because the under, underneath the big driver here is rising income inequality, uh, which always, you know, we, we can observe that. What we're looking at is still, out the, we look out the window, we can see that income inequality has risen uh, or deteriorated, I guess is a better word, worsened for about 70% of the global population over the past 10 years. Uh, not here in Canada, by the way, just saying, uh, that's that's an important distinction, uh, but the perception is still there that uh, there's enormous uh, take in income at the top, and uh, a lot of folks uh, feel as though they've been left behind. Um, this is the kind of uh, dissension that, or, or tension which gives rise to a shift to populism, you know, sort of the the Trump outcome or the, the Johnson outcome in the UK or, you know, shift towards uh, populism across Europe, you know, not an absolute shift, but a drift, let's say. And and so those that sense of being left out, uh, what it does is it causes politics to polarize because people will attach to that. And of course, when we, when we add layer on uh, social media, now every point of view becomes much more magnified, much more... Yeah. Uh, louder than than any other. It always sounds like there are millions of people that think something, even if it's only a small number. Mm -hmm. So the result is this polarization is making it harder and harder for us to reach a consensus in elections or or in actually post-election getting things done. Uh, even within the same philosophy uh, party would, would find there's a lot of competition for what the decision should look like. And so I'm skeptical that we're suddenly going to start making great decisions. I think the fourth industrial revolution will make this trend worse. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a trend, not a state, this income, this income inequality problem. It will get worse before it gets better. And in that kind of environment, I think politics will get more divisive, not less. And so, you know, it's an appeal to that kind of leadership. You're right. Uh, and yet I leave that analysis skeptical that it's actually going to happen. And one of my central conclusions is that if we're going to address these things, it's probably going to be companies uh, that address them because they'll see it as in their best interest uh, to do so. Well, that's a great because that whole discussion about climate change, um, you know, to have a Bank of Canada governor talking about climate change and talking about a responsibility across pillars, not just government, uh, people, government, business, uh, and that kind of relates to your opening commentary around business governance and whose job is it. It's not short term, it's long term. That means looking more than one uh, quarter into the year. How have we how have we helped the world, not just helped our balance sheet? So uh, it, it's, it's impressive to have a, a, a former Bank of Canada governor talk about it, the influence on business. Um, I guess if, if it kind of spills over into governance of the country, of multiple levels of government, and if business takes its stake in, the, in this discussion, uh, it might be more encouraging for everyone else to say, well, if they can do it, I guess we need to do it. And yeah. I thought that the pandemic actually moved that along much quicker when when we could see dolphins swimming around Venice and the canals. It, it to me was like a turning point. Oh, my God, when the people go away, the, the, the earth prospers. And uh, <laughs> everyone started looking for these examples. Um, yeah. And now, of course, in a very tragic way, understanding our use of energy and its impact 
to the to the politics of the world that right. so many companies would just uh, our countries rather would abstain uh, from a vote uh, against Putin and it's all <clears throat> underpinned by energy it's, it, it's a sad state of affair um, so I guess the way you reference climate change you, you do mean that it is everyone's responsibility and maybe if they hear you say it they're going to take a good look in the mirror uh, that they might not have done uh, but what led you to ha actually spend so much time talking about climate change in the book and what do you hope to achieve with it well climate change is uh, one of the five big forces that identify that are in motion um, and uh, you know and, and unusually so that is uh, this in this particular era this is an important overlay for us the transition to net zero by 2050 is a, is a, is a huge shift uh, and therefore tectonic, and it's only 30 years. I mean, that's you think of that a long time, but it's it's not really and and measured in this way. So uh, when I when I thought about that, I thought, well, that's of course another major source of uncertainty, and and not just uncertainty because we don't know which path we'll actually follow. Uh, if it were simple, of course, we wouldn't have had COP26. You know, COP26 was the 26th time uh, that those folks got together to try and figure all this out. It is a very complex uh, issue for the world and therefore for business. If you could tell business, okay, this is exactly how we are going to get to 2050. Now fit your plans in that. Uh, well, you know, that would be wonderful. And I think they would all figure out a way to get there and uh and then and then we would just get there uh but instead what we do is we we get this kind of vague oh, well this is where we're going to get to we're not sure how and we're not certain of all the different policies that we've put in place between now and then so i believe that 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 level of confusion is probably going to persist that through time there will be nudges and guidance and policies but none of them will get to be a definitive path and therefore, the main uh, mechanism for getting us to 2050 is going to be investor and stakeholder enforcement, which we can see very active now. I mean, if you're a company that has not laid out how you're going to get from here to 2050, chances are you're either your either your customers, your employees, and especially your investors, your shareholders, are already uh, screaming at you for that. And so everybody's developing these plans and also, you know, measuring in increments, you know, how they're going from point A to point B. Even many companies now are putting ESG commitments in their uh, in their compensation packages for their executive team. That's very powerful accountability. And so with, with that in mind, I'm I'm very hopeful that 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 enforcement mechanism is going to get us there, even if there remains kind of a an uncertainty from uh, from government. This will be more powerful than sporadic green policies. But bear in mind that you know right now, like 80% of our of our energy in the world uh, comes from conventional conventional energy. Um, we expect 50 to 60% growth in the demand for energy at the global level between now and 2050. Uh, that's an enormous increase. Uh, that that that's just you know mother nature. I mean that you know the things that are ex existential are food, water, and energy. That people will need this. So how do we get there? Well, that enormous increase in the demand for energy could be accommodated through totally green investment. Well, that would be a huge huge leap, but let's assume we can do it. Well, if we do that, then still around half of global energy needs will still be coming from conventional sources. So to think that we can just flip a switch and switch to electricity is, is just folly. This, is, this, this means a, a huge change in uh, humankind's existence. Uh, I think instead what we need to square to that circle is to invest very heavily in carbon capture uh, and, and do it in such a way that we actually achieve net zero okay net zero is not the same as zero so that canada can be a leading provider of conventional energy around the world while also being a global leader in carbon capture utilization and storage the budget makes an important step forward in this direction and actually incents companies to do it sooner than later uh, i think that is very very clever and i think that's going to have a significant impact 
uh, we know the technology exists to reverse all the emissions that are in the, the atmosphere. So, and it's going to take green energy investments in order to do it in a clean way. And in Canada has every capability here. So I'm very hopeful that we're going to get there. Well, and do you think that what's happening around the world now because of the war in Ukraine and what Russia has done uh, and what countries will now refuse to do, they've gotten right to that precipice until you talk about energy. And uh, do you think that Canada has a role that they could play potentially that could benefit us even in the short term uh, while the world can figure out how can they change from their heavy dependence on a political nightmare uh, and instead uh, start doing their own investing or importing of, of better energy that's going to help them meet their needs? Well, absolutely. I mean, it is it's regrettable that we're not already in a position with with extra capacity in our energy system, let's say to we, you know, we could be shipping uh, great amounts of LNG to Europe uh, by now if we'd made, you know, decisions a long time ago when we could have uh, to develop these resources. Now uh, that would that would of course at the time excite all kinds of opposition. But what I think people need to understand is we can get to green while at the same time as investing in conventional in such a way that we have energy security. Think, think of the conventional energy investments as kind of backup plans for when something happens like what we're facing today. And uh, knowing also that if, if Canada's in a position to replace, let's say, all the coal in the world with natural gas or super green uh, energy coming from, from other uh, fossil fuel forces having been uh, under a uh, CCUS umbrella, then that's exactly what we should do. We can help the world achieve uh, these very goals. So I think uh, it's going to require boldness, though, uh, Sandra. We ha we have to uh, decide that this is a role for us, and then and use that then as our reason for for busting through these these various barriers, the things that that slow us down and make us very slow deciders. Uh, because actually the world's not going to wait for that. Um, Canada has been blessed with all this and in a position to help and indeed to prosper uh, based on it, uh, but only if we get up, get up and get on it. Um, and so, yes, I think the situation has really reminded everyone that energy security counts for a lot. Uh, to switch to wind and, and solar and, you know, uh, possibly nuclear. These are all terrific. These are exactly what the things that we need to do as a global society. Uh, but we can't do it and assume the wind blows the same speed every day because it doesn't. You need to build extra capacity in there so that you can flex uh, between them. And uh, all, all in all, I think uh, just, a rem just a reminder, every chance you get, remind people, don't forget, it's net zero. It's not zero. Well, it, yeah, and I think it's a good lesson uh, for people who really watch the energy uh, debate that a stepped process to eventually get to a real solution um, is far more likely to have a positive outcome than some kind of a massive sudden shift that is simply not going to work, uh, not for the Canadian economy and, and not for the world. We've got just a few more minutes and I had to get this discussion in so people can know a little bit about you uh, and, and your role when you were at the Bank of Canada. And then I think Andrew is going to jump back in with some questions from people who are watching. Um, but it's nice to know Know that you referenced in your book being a good Oshawa boy uh, growing <laughs> up in, uh, in car town uh, and I can relate to that coming from Windsor and growing up uh, with our economy so buffeted by how well the auto industry was doing and you're probably heartened with some of the recent announcements as I am in Windsor with battery and and you are with a new GM investment um, but you constantly reference leadership so I have to show everybody this ten dollar bill that really made the news and and i i want people to know why you were so proud of this because it was something you didn't think could happen in your term and that is putting a woman uh, on some of our currency uh, but there's a bit of a story not just on the fact that you did it but also how our bank of canada uh, our governor signed this one because it's usually initial and last name very uh, stodgy if i may say but uh, your, your full first and last name on this $10 bill. So tell us a bit of the story on how we got Viola on our $10 bill. 
Sure, I'll, I'll try to be brief, but it's, it is one of my favorite stories. You're right. Uh, and so, first about the signature, um, you know, on my very first day at the bank, this is the thing you look forward to your whole life. You know, if, if you're a monetary economist, imagine having your signature on the money. I mean, it just doesn't get any better than that. And so, and so on the very first day, they bring a sheet of paper with 10 boxes and a special pen and you sign in each of the boxes and you pick your favorite one and that's one that's going to appear on the money. It's, it's not, not rocket science, but at the time I wanted to sign it with my full name. As you say, past governors have just used an initial and their last name. And the reason that for that is because Stephen uh, is not just my first name, it's my, my, my mother's family name. So, uh, you know, Mary and Stephen. So anyway, so I wanted both family names to appear on the money. Um, and, um, and so uh, I, I thought that was, of course, a bit of a debate on the very first day. I mean, no, no, that's not, <laughs> that's not how it's done. As you say, stodgy <laughs> is in. And, uh, and so anyway, I insisted, and, uh, and so that's how it turned out. And as you know, you can see there that Carolyn Wilkins followed that same tradition, first woman to sign, uh, sign Canada's money. Uh, you know, having, knowing that story, she signed her full name uh, as well, which I was, was very proud of. But the, the Viola Desmond, it was that very same day. This was in 2013, and I said, well, well how long is it gonna take for us to have an iconic Canadian woman on the money? And they said, oh, we'd never be able to do that during your term. Uh, we just finished developing all these new banknotes, so it'll be at least 10 years before we'll have a new one. And I said, no, that's, that's not acceptable. And so uh, uh, I can tell you, I'll give Carolyn a lot of credit too for it, because she was responsible for that group when she was senior deputy governor. And the, the genius idea was, why do we have to place them all at once? Let's just do one at a time. And so, uh, doesn't sound like a really hard uh, solution, really, but it, that's what we did. So the Viola Desmond one was a, a fabulous process where Canadians all submitted their ideas. There were thousands and thousands of submissions, something like 500 unique nominees, um, and lots of kids uh, nominate their mom, which is really cute. Uh, but uh, and they and first mom, no, mom them can't go on. But but anyway, uh, in the end, uh, I think it's a very very successful thing. And of course, going to the vertical orientation was another design change that gives a much bigger image of Viola than we would have on the traditional shape. So all in all, I, you know, we are all as a team very very proud of that outcome. And it took five years as opposed to ten. Well, I think it's a great story, and certainly women and men in Canada appreciated it. And certainly, picking her as the first uh, mm -hmm. as the first woman to appear on the bill was fantastic for for a number of reasons. Um, I, hopefully, everyone will get out there and pick up a book. I will tell you that it's not um, it is not like an economist writing a book, which might which might throw some people off. And though I'm not going to do that unless I'm trying to sleep. It isn't. Uh, I think you wrote the book um, like you're speaking to us today, certainly understandable, and using everyday examples that we can relate to. Why is the cost of bread so expensive right now in the store and only going to be more so? Um, you had a really good explanation for what inflation is going to do to us young people and what we can look forward to, maybe focusing that leaders, whatever level of government they're at, uh, they need to get their head around what's coming uh, because we can see what's coming. These aren't going to be surprises in many cases. Uh, so we really appreciated that. And let me give the last comment to you before we throw open for questions. Um, will you write another book? Well, I, honestly, I don't know. I mean, I honestly, Sandra, I didn't tell anybody I was writing that book until it was, you know, accepted and, and signed up as being published. I, I felt a little, sounded a little pretentious to say, oh, I'm working on a book. Uh, because of course people were immediately want to know well, when's it coming out and I had no idea if it ever would so uh -huh. I'm very very uh, heartened by all this so I won't I'll never say never uh, but I think uh, I think it is uh, I, I now have quite an admiration for, uh, for real authors because it's a lot harder work than it looks cracking open the book. Well, good for you and congratulations on another success story. And I think Canadians will be well served if they pick up a copy of uh, The Next Age of Uncertainty. So thanks for that. Andrew, Thank I'm you. happy to pass the floor over to you and we can get into some questions. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, we can. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry that my, my audio, audio is not working today. Um, but, but, um, 
my visual is not working, the audio is. So let me just uh, proceed with some of the questions uh, for, for Governor Polo. Thank you very much for the session so far. It's been fascinating. We've had a number of questions come in. Um, and I've combined a few as uh, some are on the same topic. So um, let's start with this one. What is your prescription for the housing crisis and the skyrocketing house prices? Yeah, well, there's a whole chapter uh, dedicated to this because I, th I think it's it just goes to the heart uh, of, of every Canadian's aspirations. I understand that. And uh, so I'm not surprised to have the question come up. I spend time in the book trying to help people understand why house prices go up. You know, it, it sounds like so simple demand supply, you know, that's a law, you know, laws of supply and demand. But uh, and of course, we do know that we haven't been building enough homes uh, to even meet the needs of our growing population. And and but I also make the point that the way cities work. Uh, if you built exactly the right number of houses, like say around the edge of Toronto or in in the core, like with uh, big high rises or something, if you built exactly the right number, the price of homes that are closer to the center would still go up as the city got bigger. That's just that's you know a first you know first thing you learn in urban economics. So 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 for me the solution of course is to improve our supply decisions through time to stop it from being such a source of speculation but that's not going to make houses suddenly affordable i think in terms of global cities we are still a bargain people acknowledge this from outside of canada that's why the government is putting you know these rules on foreign speculators uh, and so we have to understand that it's going to cost more to put a roof over your heads. And so I think what we need is a broader array of financial tools that give people more choices into how they get themselves into the housing market, whether it is rental or something more closer to rent to own over time, or if it's even co-ownership models, which of course is emerging uh, area, or more flexibility in the actual mortgage product itself. I mean, my goodness, we're still dealing with the same products uh, that are from the post-war period. Uh, they're the only innovation in my entire life on the mortgage front has been the invention of the HELOC that allows you to borrow against your house by writing a check. Uh, that's not much innovation. So I expect that necessity will promote more innovation uh, in the financial services business and give us more than one, more than one alter or two alternatives to how we put a roof over our heads. Yeah, uh, can, can I ask that the uh, government, uh, governments have been um, trying to make it easier for people to get into the market, especially first time buyers. Is that good or bad? I mean, is that uh, bringing too many people onto the market with a shortage of housing? Well, as long as uh, I, th I think we should be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Uh, I mean, of course, and that's what government policy tries to do. Uh, you know, the most let's say the most of their voters are people that would like to own a home. So if you introduce some tools that make it a little bit easier, uh, but at the same time, you're offering up important programs to boost supply even though it's not so much purely a federal issue, right? It is, it's more local or provincial issues, but uh, as long as the incentives are there for us to speed up the supply, then I think you are, you're, you're helping both sides of the problem. Uh, you can't analyze these things by themselves. I mean, you can't just say, oh, that policy is bad because it adds to demand. Well, if I'm adding to supply at the same time, you know, I am trying to walk and chew gum at the same time. And, you know, I think that's, 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 well, that's what we can expect anyway. So. I won't criticize. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, what are your views on uh, cryptocurrencies? Should the should the Bank of Canada be involved in any way, or should it stay out of the field? Well, uh, yeah, the term crypto, you know, maybe maybe well, let's just leave it. You you call it crypto, but anyway, let's say digital currencies is a better way to think of it. Uh, that is uh, it's like the same as the cash in your pocket, except it's a digital form. And I think, uh, you know, one of the responsibilities of any central bank is to provide people with whatever form of money they would prefer to use. And if there is a growing trend towards preferring having a digital money, it would be in the form, let's say, it's either in your phone 
which you know you never leave home without it or you know one of these uh, powerful little cards that you know you just tap and the money money transfers instantly it doesn't go through an intermediary or anything it's just going through that electronic system uh that's going to happen i'm sure of it and therefore central banks all around the world will end up issuing digital currencies um, and so there will be digital Canadian dollars uh, and it'll be run by the Bank of Canada, just like the cash in your pocket is run by the Bank of Canada. Um, they're getting, everybody's getting ready for that uh, so that it can be done whenever the, whenever the, you know, the, the needle tips over, you know, when, when it's ready, the system will get it. In the meantime, we have these other merging technologies, which are very interesting, creating all kinds of new tech for payment systems. Um, you know, new asset classes such as crypto, such as Bitcoin or Ethereum, these kinds of things. These are very interesting innovations. I think of them more as unusual asset classes as opposed to monies. And it's an important distinction. You may wish to put some of your, your wealth into Bitcoin, let's say. That's up to you. I mean, I think it, I, I worry about it because it has zero intrinsic value. If, uh, if, it's, if you're hedging against inflation, I would rather put the money into real estate, which has centuries of inflation protection demonstrated, uh, but you know, to each his or her own. Uh, you know, Bitcoin is emerging as a valid asset class. I just don't think it's likely to be a transaction vehicle. Yeah, and, and what's your thought about the Bank of Canada? Uh, some people would, would want to believe that, that digital currencies are better off being free of of the Bank of Canada's involvement, what what's your thought uh, about that? Yeah, no, I, I actually think that's a very uh, misleading line of argument, um, and it takes a little bit of examination of history. Uh, so, which I do in the book, Frank, actually. And so, if we if we think about think about a Bitcoin standard, you know, where money, like in the sense of Friedrich Hayek, you know, famous Austrian economist who first wrote about competing monies or private delivered money. I mean, uh, you're talking about we had private monies, you know, back in the Civil War era, you know, in the United States, and there's a lot of literature on that disaster. Okay, we had uh, so it's not it's not saying this would be a disaster, but it has the potential for disaster. It needs to be highly regulated so people don't get hurt. Um, and so that's that's one one way to look at this. Uh, the other way is to think having a, a standard uh, such as Bitcoin is very similar in properties to a gold standard. Okay, so it's hard, it's perceived as hard money. No one can expand the supply except that little wee bit uh, from extra mining. Same thing with gold. Well, I just tell you that uh, when we have an industrial revolution like the first three, um, that deflation I talked about earlier interacts with a gold standard. It happens so so that it actually there's no flexibility to expand the money supply to accommodate the new productivity that's being generated in the economy. Therefore, you really do get deflation. And when that happens, you have the Victorian Depression. And then in the 30s, you had the Great Depression. And we didn't have one in the third Industrial Revolution. Why? Because monetary policy was being conducted by central banks flexibly to target on inflation as opposed to targeting zero inflation. So imagine today we're on a Bitcoin standard, price of oil doubles, every other price in the economy would have to go down in order to bring us to a new equilibrium. That's very difficult to digest. If you're a company and the price of your stuff has to go down and you have debt, the debt doesn't go down. Just your ability to service the debt goes down. That's why we have depressions when we have deflations. So I think it's a non-starter uh, on the way you posed it, Andrew. Yeah. Okay. Um, By the way, we, we know, lastly, a couple of questions years. about personal debt. Could you comment on your thoughts about the levels of household debt and student debt today? Yes. Well, I just want to ask one last thought, and that is that over time, through those depressions, we've learned how to do better monetary policy. Okay, and that's why we don't need to go, to go all, retrace our steps and go back to a, a hard currency standard. It's it's not not superior. But anyway, uh, in terms of debt, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, again, in the the book, I talk about not just government debt, but but all three corporate uh, and personal debt. 
And it seems like many of the innovations that we've seen uh, over, the la over the last 30 years have encouraged uh, more, more household debt. Sometimes it's just to accommodate the purchase of a home, but there's lots of innovations in car loans and other debt. And so uh, in a way, we know that those innovations mean that people can carry more debt today than they were capable of in the old days. Okay, so a less restrictive, it's kind of a, it's like an all you can eat buffet uh, these days. You know, you can kind of basically decide for yourself how much debt you'll have. Uh, well, okay, so that comes with responsibility. And it's not just uh, responsibility of the borrower, it's the responsibility of the lender to have a certain, uh, let's say, overview of how this individual is doing. So just take, for instance, uh, these days you have to qualify for mortgage, you have to be able to show you can sustain a two percentage point increase in interest rates with, with the, your income. Well, that's a pretty good rule. That builds on a buffer into the system. Well, what happens the day after you're qualified? Well, the, that household can just go ahead and borrow other money if they want, uh, you know, buy, buy a car, borrow for that, and so on. So that maybe the buffer is all gone by the time the mortgage gets renewed. Well, who's in charge of that? I think just the borrower and the lender. And so uh, I get this comment all the time that it's central bank's fault, that people are indebted. I don't think that's true. I think it's the borrowers and the lenders uh, who have uh, responsibility for this. In the end, I think their fragility must be acknowledged. You know, what, I'm, what we're headed for is an era of more uncertainty, more volatility. And if you're carrying a lot of debt, you're vulnerable to that. And that vulnerability will get higher even if debt doesn't go up anymore. It'll get higher because the volatility will get higher. You'll lose your job more often for a shorter time, perhaps, that kind of thing. So in the end, I think people will have to build buffers too, not just companies, not just governments, but people will have to build bigger buffers to deal with the next stage of uncertainty. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a heavy, heavy note to end on. Um, we're, we're out of time. I, I just before our final thank yous, and I'll ask Sandra if she's got a last word. I, I just want to remind our audience that uh, this is the start of our annual conference. Um, we have a session this afternoon on what is the world coming to. Lloyd Axworthy will be in conversation with our three co chairs, Indira Naidu Harris, Frank Bayless, and Dave Boomer. Uh, that's at uh, 4 p.m. this evening, and tomorrow at 7 p.m., we'll be talking about. Um, a vision for a new parliamentary precinct, uh, dealing with a new new vision essentially for for Wellington Street. So that'll be tomorrow at 7 p.m. And then there's a series of webinars the next two days. Uh, Governor Poas, uh, thank you for joining us today uh, for the second year in a row for our annual conference. It you've dealt with a lot of very weighty and and um, issues of concern to people at this particular point in in Canadian history and world history that are quite troubling and people are looking for answers. And in your usual style, you've made these uh, issues a lot more understandable. Uh, so thank you for that. And I'll turn back to Sandra for a last word of thanks. Thanks. Uh, I think you did that for us, Andrew. I just wanted to say, uh, Stephen, thanks so much for the book, uh, but also just for showing leadership in some of the topics that you decided to slay uh, while you were busy writing this book that you didn't want to tell anyone about. Uh, but I think if people have a chance to have a look, either by uh, by an audio book like I did or, or by the hardcover, um, I think you're going to feel better when it's through because it makes sense. And it, it sort of left me with a feeling of calm when I was through, like, you know what, this too shall pass. We're going to be fine. That's how I felt. So uh, I think on that note, I want to say thanks for the hard work you put into actually creating it. And I hope you'll join the Pearson Center again in the future. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. And good to have you back, Sandra. Thanks. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye.